Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday. Appreciate you being with us. Dustin Schutte, co-host from Outsider.com as always. And we're joined by the great Dane Fife. How are you, sir? I love that great in front of my name. I, did you guys, uh, you guys are actually right in the golf club, huh? Yes, sir. Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, high atop the 18th fairway. I love driving out there. You see your name on that sign. And uh, it's funny, I played in a scramble there this summer with my sister-in-law. And I'm pretty sure I fired one right off. Maybe maybe your office. Has your office uh, got a window? No, I, I stay hidden. They keep me hidden in an underground right. bunker. <laughs> but that sign that you spoke of is funny you mentioned that. Because that was a uh, that was a part of the show not too long ago, John. I don't know if you can grab that quick enough, but some woman thought that she needed. That's not the one. That was in the result of her. But she, this lady, felt she needed to remove this sign. It was off property, um, <laughs> and she had to make probably two trips because she had to go back over there with some cutters and cut it down. Um, and which she did. So I'm not sure if you have that one, John, but uh, that's one with the woman walking. But yeah, she cut that thing down. And and uh, I was just back from Big Ten Media Days 15 minutes when I found out about it. And someone told me and I had the picture and she's walking across the fairway with the sign under her arm and the clippers <laughs> in her hand with the the things still, the, the ties still hanging off of the sign itself. It was pretty funny. Uh, so that sign is not there right there. Um, not, so, But I'm going to have to replace that sign, especially since you noticed it. Mm -hmm. Let's get a lawyer. Let's get it put back up there. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, no, you know what? I, I need a bigger sign now. So just going bigger. But, John, the sign, put that. You can put the one you put back up, John. Um so I decided this person, if she was that interested, that she should have a, an autograph sign. So I had one, an extra one. So I autographed the back of, of one and put it in her front yard for her. <laughs> That's a great move. That's so great. I need one well, of those. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. I'll get you one, brother. Uh, I'll get you one. How's the family doing? The family's great. We're enjoying the fall. We just went out and grabbed some pumpkins and uh, we're going to have oh, the... Wow. Well, it's not really pumpkin carving night. It's more of uh, keeping my uh, 12 and 9-year-old from brawling, which anytime they're together. But I actually captured them in the wild getting along for like six seconds the other day. It was live and it was raw footage of my 12 and 9-year-old daughters getting along for about six <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't happen very often uh, and great to hear. It is that time of year, nothing more fun. Uh Fall's a time of change. Uh, change is coming for you, I understand, and very happy, good changes uh, right now. I'll let you uh, bust that news, but uh, you're about to become a, a bigger star than you already were. <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to get into do a little TV this year, uh, and I am going to do some games for Oakland and hopefully potentially some, some work with Big Ten. But ultimately, the goal is to get back into coaching. Um, although I've always kind of dreamed of doing some TV, if it works out, I could keep do and I could keep doing that. Uh, but there's potential there. But I think ideally, get back into coaching, get back into the college basketball world, and um, you know, uh, start you know where I left off and doing uh, doing work with with players and helping kids. Uh, you know, grow into men and hopefully and eventually achieving their dreams. Yeah. I mean, coaching is something it's hard to just give up, uh, especially when that's what you have done, especially if you're still competitive. Uh, that's a, a great outlet to get, but then once you get a taste of working in TV, sometimes it's a little easier of a schedule, not always, but uh, a, a little bit more of a life. I don't think people understand if you're a coach, you don't really have a life. But even if you're in TV, you still don't have as much as one as people. But um, what is it about TV that you think you would enjoy, uh, say, being an analyst for BTN? Well, part part of it is the, um, you know, the less demand, you know, if, if 
if I'm just in basketball, then it's, then it's, you know, you, you tend, I think there's some time off. And one of the things I've really enjoyed with this time off is you just get a lot more time to be a dad, you know, to be a husband, uh, to really, uh, spend time with family. Uh, everybody asks me if I've been playing golf and I'd say, heck no, other than a scramble that I get invited to. Um, and I usually don't last the full 18 holes. Um, so all those, you know, the time with family is, is just something that I've really relished and enjoyed. And, um, I learned that we had, we had two dogs in the family. I didn't even know we had dogs. Um, <laughs> you know, I've learned the art of going out and walking outside. I'm actually enjoying the fall leaves. I took a drive the other day just in, to enjoy the, the the change in colors of the leaves. So Some good ones I'm here. Old. Maybe I'm just getting uh, closer to your age, Jim. You see, that's the good thing about you. You will never get closer uh, to my yeah, age. That wasn't really nice, was it, Jim? That no, I'm. Just, yeah, I'm that's sorry. okay because you'll never get closer to my age that's the good thing i'm hey i'm being mr positive well 70s you'll never i'm 70 is a good age it's it's hey years and um i just want to try to if i if i knew i could look this good at 70 i would have taken better care of myself <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, when you went up go ahead dustin I was going to ask, uh, Dane, you said that, that ultimately maybe the goal is to, to get back into coaching, but I'm curious, uh, curious you know, I, I've heard a lot of different coaches in different sports have said, you know, um, we, we, I walk past the uh, winning locker room and I really miss coaching. And then all of a sudden I walk past the losing locker room and, and you know, I, I don't miss it quite as much. Um, if TV goes, it goes well, if, if you enjoy the broadcasting aspect of it, I mean, is that something you think you would be looking forward to doing more permanently or, or um, is that, is it uh, coaching still a, a, an, an itch you're, you're looking to scratch? Well, I, I do think, you know, as, as I said, I think coaching uh, is in my blood and always has been, but, uh, and it's funny, you talk about the losing locker room and I'm sure you've heard this before, but psychology, you know, psychologists will say that, you know, especially head coach, you know, when, when you lose, it's literally, and I mean this, they, they say it's comparable to a death in the family. And it is just that intense. And we can say it's just a game and we can say we make plenty of money, but it never changes as a head coach when you lose. Because you think you're getting fired. You think the you, you see the snowball effect and the, the ball starts rolling and you envision yourself getting fired and what your next move is. Um, so, so that, that losing locker room, it's funny you brought that up. Um, but broadcasting, um, you know, it, if, especially in basketball for me, uh, would still be getting a taste of, of the game and enjoying the game and being around the coaches, being around the players. That was something that I really enjoyed this summer was I coached an AAU team here in, in Indianapolis AAU team. Indy Heat, it was the 16 and under. But the one thing I really didn't think I'd miss, and, and I found that I missed, was the camaraderie in the summer with the coaches. You know, we even get a chance to spend time with the, the, the officials because they're doing officiating camps uh, in conjunction with the tournaments. And so you know, ultimately, there's a lot of good people out there in coaching and in the business that, um, have become friends, have begun, have be, they're, they're people that I enjoy being around. They're people that, um, it's just a big network of friends eventually if you're in it long enough. And so, um, you know, you, I guess back to your original question, I think, uh, broadcasting would be a, I'd be, with broadcasting, I'd be able to stay in the game and around the people that I, that I really like and enjoy. Yeah, and it's uh, I've seen a lot of coaches who just they they fall in love with it because it's not only is it a way to still use that coaching uh, ability and education, but now you're able to do it in a completely different way as opposed to giving that knowledge to certain whether it's your guys on your team. Now you're doing it to an entire audience, and 
and more so it's different teams all the time. So you get to see completely different basketball, talk about different basketball, describe different areas of basketball. And here's an amazing thing. I, 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 I I'm going to do a poll. I haven't yet. And I meant to do it already, but of, I want to see who Indiana fans favorite play by play guy is right now, because I would not be shocked if that happens to be Robbie Hummel and the the amazing thing about that, of course, is that Robbie Hummel played at Purdue. And while some people would say, well, why does that matter? Oh, it matters. But not for him. He has, and he was on the show last week um, when we were up at Big Ten Media Days. He just has a great personality. He's just a great guy. He does a great job. And there's nothing not to like. And so for Indiana fans to like a Purdue guy doing games, that's just shows you that man they just appreciate good good work yeah it's interesting because i think that's what robbie has done he's honed in on becoming the best and that's that that's kind of a uh unique case for a for a former player they it's really hard for former players especially that quickly to do what he's done and, he, and he's at the top of his craft right now and the, when I talk to people about how he got there they just simply say that he puts in the work and he treats people right and it's allowed him to to rise to the top quickly and he does do a great job it would you got to put that Jim Coyle poll out there we got to see that poll but um uh, you know, I'm not resigned to coaching or, um, you know, being a broadcaster. I've really enjoyed do- learning about other things. <laughs> For example, uh, I'm going to get certified in insurance. And if I am ge- if I get crazy enough during this time, I'm going to try to pass the Series 7 tests. And, and uh, my wife, Blair, is getting her master's. Um, and so I've really enjoyed learning things that I really haven't had a chance to do. And, um, you know, I'm not opposed to doing other things either. So you never know, Jim, you may never see this face again, which would probably make you happy. (laughs) Never, but see that, but that's taking advantage of life, uh, getting certified in insurance, your wife, getting a master's that's incredible accomplishments. First of all, I took that series seven, by the way, a long, long time ago. I know all about that. Um, enjoy that. Enjoy studying for that. Full advantage. I hope you're a good math. Um, I was good math in seventh grade, but that's probably where it stopped. But uh, but you know, I'll tell you something ironic, and I think it's, it was very, very wise. Uh, there is a member, and you probably know this now, or you may not because it may have happened. Uh, there is a member of the IU basketball team that has gotten his real estate license. Uh-oh. Very. How smart is that? Oh, that's that's Mr. Uh, Mr. Leal. Yes, sir. Oh, how yeah. how smart is that? That's impressive, man. That that really is, especially uh, uh, when year three. When he year told four. me that. Yeah. When he told me that, I was like, "Wow, uh, I would not have thought to do that, Dane." No, me either. Me either. But you what, thought what? to get your series seven, so there's that. <laughs> Just <laughs> that. Uh, one of the things I'd like to uh, ask about on the on the coaching realm, Dana, is, is just kind of how much, uh, you know, Jim and I talk and we don't really have all that much knowledge about it, but we, we talk about NIL and the transfer portal and how much that's kind of changed, how much that's changed college basketball, the recruiting aspect. I mean, we just kind of see it from afar, but what's, how much has, has the, have these new rules in college basketball and all across all across college sports. How much has that changed the recruiting? How much has that changed the relationships uh, between players and coaches? Is it really as dramatic as, as what some people lead on? Or is it, um, I guess, just what's the insight on, on some of that? Well, you know, for forever, you, as coaches, we've had to identify what is most important to a recruit and his family. And that hasn't changed. But I, I think what has changed is it was never negotiated, uh, at least with most programs. Money was not the primary negotiator. Um, it was education and it was future. 
And so for most of us um, to have to discuss financials, first, it's 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 only difficult probably because it's uncharted waters for us. Um, and then the second part of it would be the transfers. Most times, you know, in the off season, you tend to, what's the number three, four, maybe five guys, but three or four max for most programs. And when I worked at Michigan state, that was probably two to three. We didn't have a lot of transfers. Um, but as you, as you, we as as I look at the top twenty five AP top twenty five and and even in the Big Ten, it's like you have no idea just because there's so many new players on each roster, and as as a coach as somebody that has to recruit, it, there is a lot of projections. You got to project who's coming, who may be going, who's definitely going. Uh, on your own team, and then you have to scour the the landscape of and evaluate other people's programs. Unfortunately, who who may be going, you know, who, who do you need? Who, who maybe as a as a um, coach that recruited a player that is on another team, but we have a rela- relationship. You know, looking at is he happy? Is he unhappy? Is he playing a lot? Um, so I do think that it's. It is. It's. It's significantly more difficult because I think most coaches recruited on, um, you know, they, they they recruited on things that they're used to. That's been that's withstood the test of time. And now there's two new dynamics, which are the financial component along with the, you know, the transfer portal. And so it, there's going to be some time where it takes getting used to. But I think in the end, you know, three, four years, all this stuff, you know, with some modifications to the to the current rules and the current things that are going on, these wrinkles will be ironed out and, and it'll become it'll be a new normal, but it'll become normal. And and what's interesting is the guys that are coming in new, these young guys, these young coaches, um, <laughs> you know, that that's really what they're learning. And. I think it's a good thing, and it's it's important to have someone on your staff like that that comes in green, and that's all they learn, because the other things you can cloud you up. The other things, as a recruiter, learning the the old ways can really muddy up your brain. Well, you know, Dane, we talk about coaching. One of the things about coaching uh, is moving around, being a nomad because of the job takes you to different places, uh, and television is a way to get away from that, uh, to, to stay in the game, but yet not have to worry about doing all the moving and all of that. How, how attractive is that aspect? Well, I, I think there's plenty of travel throughout the season, but, um, I, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's not a lot of good jobs available to where, you know, you're comfortable financially. Um, and I think proximity to where you work is, is important too. You know, being in Bloomington, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I can get too many places very easily and very quickly. Um, whether it's a studio, you know, or a, or a different city. Um, but I think one of the things that have always attracted me to. to oh, we'll set you up in the golf club at Eagle Point Studios anytime, brother. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Just don't ask me to golf. <laughs> so what's up next? Uh, you, you've, I, I know you've done some uh, demos, screen tests. How nervous was that for you the first time you sat down? Because you've done enough TV throughout your career. You've been on the other end of it. This was a different style. What was it like doing this this side of it for you uh, on the practice runs? It was nerve-wracking because every time I've done TV before, I had job security. <laughs> now I was potentially looking for a job. So it was a little nerve-wracking. Um, and there's so many things to think about, too, when you're, you know, the the techniques um, instead of just freelancing like I'd usually do on TV, uh, looking at the camera, looking at the, uh, the moderator, looking at the, um, you know, not looking down, not moving too much. 
So uh, there's a lot of things to think about. So I was pretty nervous, but I think as I've, as I've had more practice and, um, you know, worked with people, talked to people, um, I feel like I'm getting more comfortable and, uh, you know, the first test will be pretty soon, early November. So, uh, you're going to have to tune in, Jim. What, 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 and, yeah, and what is that going to be? What is the first broadcast there in early November? What is that? It's uh, Oakland University, and uh, it's they're playing uh, Defiance, which I think is an exhibition, but um, early November. I, I'm, I'm only working uh, a day ahead right now, so uh, I'll give you the date here at some point. <laughs> I'll what format you. is that? Who is it on? Where can we catch that? Why did you do that? I, th- I believe it's ESPN Plus. We'll find that out and we'll get that information out. Well, one of the things, Dane, that uh, that uh, Robbie Hummel told us last week was uh, about midway through, or about halftime of his very first broadcast, he said he hated this. He never wanted to do it again. Um, and now he's he's obviously flourishing in that role. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. It, it's going to be fun. We'll definitely tune in. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some butterflies there, but it sounds like once you get through that first game, it's 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 smooth sailing after that. Yeah, I think so. I, I do think it just takes some time and things that people have told me in the business to just look, just talk ball, just talk basketball. That's from a coaching perspective. You don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to. Well, have- you talked about so many different things for you to think out, think about it's it's very similar to coaching because you have so many things going on whether yeah. it's offensively and defensively and having to make in-game adjustments uh or it, 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 whether it's for the entire team or the way the the offense is going or individual in-game adjustments so there's so many things that you have to do as a coach that I think that you'll be able to carry over into this especially once you do it a time or two it will start to become uh, old hat for you quicker than the normal person because of those situations that you've been in. You know what, Jim, I agree. I think you're exactly right. Uh, you know, I, I should hire you. Pub, my I agree. Pub- <laughs> certified publicist. I agree. I could not be a CPA, but I can be a CPP. <laughs> You just can't be your own publicist. I think where that, where your sign was put placed in that nice person's yard, um, <laughs> that's probably not a good idea, Jim. Well, I wouldn't have been there if she hadn't stolen the other one. Just thought she wanted one to match it. It was on her property. No, no, that's the whole. That was the whole point. It wasn't so funny, uh, but you know, people are funny. People are funny, Dane. That's what they do. Um, right. So. When, let's see, we've got uh, Oakland versus Defiant, your first. That's got to be – so when you're going into that, how are you going to – besides knowing the teams uh, and scouting, which is another thing that will avail you to this job because you're used to that. That's going to make it a lot easier for you than the, the average person because you're used to scouting teams and knowing players and knowing guys and knowing their tendencies. That's got to be a big help uh, in, in this job for you. Well, it does, but I – one of the things that I learned is just the human interest stories. And I, I really enjoy learning about people. And so I'd imagine I'll be making some phone calls to each team and hopefully being able to get there and see their practice or shoot arounds and get to know them a little better. But um, the human interest story uh, always has been something that I've enjoyed learning. Uh, but the, and then you, the key, though, is how to fit it in and sound bites. You know, in a, in a game, in a broadcast, sound bites, and you know, there's worry of talking over the play-by-play guy, or um, you know, talking too long, which I like to do. Have you uh, watched the move, the series Winning Time? Is that uh, Lakers? Yeah, <laughs> that was the, the kind of the the one that made Jerry West so mad. Oh yeah, well it should, yeah, well, this you portrayed know. him. But the reason that I'm asking is because uh, the great broadcaster for the Lakers, Chick Hearn, um, originally Pat, um, um, oh dag on it, Pat Riley wasn't a uh, like his color guy, but then Chick didn't want a color guy. It was just Chick Hearn. So right. Pat Riley would get like two words out, and he would give him hold up the fist. <laughs> 
and that meant <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Dustin, do you so at least that to Jim. Yeah, but it doesn't. It doesn't really work. No. I mean, he just no, blows. He's like. Act. He's like he's like a locom he's like a locomotive, Dane. Once he gets going, there ain't no slowing him down. Do that. I can see that, and I can hear that. I'd well, you know that's yeah. Well, you know I tell you, you'll be once you get going, it'll be so <laughs> funny. Once you get comfortable, you'll be so much better, and uh, he'll be giving you the fist, saying that's enough. Um, but uh, yeah, you just don't, just don't do what what Coach Knight did there toward the end when he started yelling at the people. Yeah, um, I remember him yelling at the officials, and I oh, no, he was like, yelling at somebody. Who was the the one I remember, which was the greatest, for whatever reason, they had the the TV guys were just back too far, and it was that was stupid because people that were those courtside seats were kind of up forward of them, and this guy kept standing or something, oh, and finally whatever. during the broadcast, Knight yells out, "Hey, you want to come back here and do the game, and let me sit there or something." <laughs> It's funny because I remember Coach Knight uh, when I played for him, and a ref would come and stand in front of him when the when the ball was in play, and I can just remember Tom Ruck or Eddie Hightower, or Ted Hillary. Gosh, dang it! Get out of the way! I can't see. Get your dad out of the way. <laughs> I'm trying to watch the game, and sure enough, they would just slide right over, and I'd look at a teammate. And say, Did you see that? You know, we'd be cracking up on the bench, but it never failed. When somebody stood in front of him, he'd either put his hand put his hand on their hip and slide them over or just yell at him, tell him to get the heck out of the way. Well, he was always working the officials, man. Uh, that's something that you don't have to do right now. But And is that something you – and I know we've gone back and forth. You said coaching is definitely something you'd like to – that you want to, at this time want to get back into unless the TV thing really works out and you fall in love with it, uh, which I, I'm telling you I can see happening uh, because obviously you have a great knowledge of the, ga of the game. Uh, uh, you're very well liked, uh, a good personality. So that's that's all it takes. And oh, like, yeah, thanks, thanks. I enjoy it. Keep going. <laughs> oh no, don't stop. Please go on. Go on, really. Go on. Uh uh, but yeah, but but that's all to what it takes. Uh having that knowledge, ha being able to see those things that th the rest of us don't see. Um, and that's what makes a great broadcaster to me, a great analyst man they just they just see those little things that you learned playing for you know i, I do a lot of post game shows with todd leary and and i just love i love learning mm -hmm. by doing those shows because <laughs> i have learned so much um by listening to him and, and people like uh you know charlie miller who's been on the show ton he used to be co-hosting with us and, and we'll be back um uh, just so many other greats it just amazes me how it's just it's like it's like reading a, a fair a, a fairy tale story to them. It's easy. It's nothing. Yeah. yeah, it does. It it becomes you know eventually, but got to move with the game though, Jim. I mean, it's important of any good uh, uh, analyst is the game changes and as an analyst, I, I've learned you, you can't get behind. You've got to keep evolving and you've got to really understand mm -hmm. each team. And what they're trying to do and i think ultimately that's really what robbie you know we talked about robbie early that's what robbie hummel has done and done it quickly and it's funny that you know you said robbie i, I didn't hear him say it but um you know robbie said, said he was ready to quit at halftime of the first game and um i can see that i guess because there there's just so many different uh different things you've got to think about during that process What's What's the hardest thing? Is it having somebody in your ear talking to you? What, what's what been the hardest part of, of doing it so far? Well, everybody says be yourself. And, you know, there's, I guess, um, trying to be yourself under those conditions. Um, it's really difficult because of you're trying to learn the art of it you're trying trying to learn the art of what makes a good broadcaster and still trying to be yourself and there's just so many different things to think about during that broadcast but it, it as you said it, it takes time and eventually um all those nuances as a 
uh, play or as a commentator, uh, they start to just uh, fall into place and which allows hopefully someone to be themselves. Yeah, it's just I, I know exactly what you're saying, because while you to be yourself, you have to be comfortable completely comfortable yeah. Yeah. and when you first start out doing what you're doing there's no way that you're going to be comfortable uh so but you will get there quickly like i said because the knowledge is there everything is there uh it just lay it out uh and that's all you'll have to do and it, it'll be fun and we look forward i look forward to it look forward to uh that oakland game man i can't wait and then even going into that hopefully looking forward to seeing you on some big 10 games uh man um great matchups the big 10 this year uh are you one of the favorites but not the favorite uh, really i mean illinois we don't uh, michigan uh i think purdue is going to surprise people michigan state is going to surprise people i think it's going to be a better year than the three teams that are currently ranked in the top 25 the big 10 um gosh i've got Indiana, Purdue, Michigan is kind of where I feel comfortable putting them in that order. And then it's just wide open after that. It's uh, I've never seen it like this. And I don't think in a, it's not in a bad way. I've just never seen the big, big 10 landscape look like this, where uh, there's been so many new players coming in and so many good players leaving And the big 10 still has plenty of good players uh, from top to bottom, but, uh, there's just been a huge change and a huge, uh, you know, a roster turnover. And it's it's really difficult once you get past those, you know, first three, in my opinion. And everything I saw where Illinois is ranked pretty high. I would tend to agree with their ability. I just don't know. I think Undy's a great coach. And I know he'll put these, that team together well. But I just don't know how the pieces are going to fit in and the rotation is going to be. Once the rotation's figured out, I'll have a better idea, but otherwise, and I say the same thing about Michigan State. Uh, I like their parts. I just want to see how their rotation shakes out, their top eight or nine, and that's the same thing with Illinois. Absolutely. We'll get you back on after your first broadcast, and we'll talk some Big Ten and, and what's going on. But, uh, man, I'm so looking forward to it. Congratulations. Uh, good luck. Uh, break a leg or an ankle or whatever you need to do. Uh, for good luck, <laughs> but uh, I hope it. Uh, I hope it's a home run for you, brother. Hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, guys. Appreciate you. Go out and have a good day. We look forward to talk to you soon, Dane. Okay. Bye, you guys.